Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Larry Cretion, and I am the Executive Director of Green Energy Consumers Alliance. And tonight, we've got a great webinar for you. It's about our interpretation of the Inflation Reduction Act at the federal level, how it affects climate uh, for you uh, at your, in your family, in your business, uh, your city or town, in the states of Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to harness the power of energy consumers to speed the transition to a zero carbon future. Uh, we were founded 40 years ago. We're celebrating that all this year. We were founded in 1982. Uh, we're serving Massachusetts and Rhode Island. We've got offices in Boston and Providence. And we, we achieve our mission through a combination of a number of different programs that consumers like you can tap into. You can get that information on our website. And also we advocate for good state level public policy. Um, but this federal law has huge implications for us and that's why we've uh, dug into it. Uh, tonight's speakers would be myself and Loie Hayes, our energy efficiency coordinator. We'll talk about uh, buildings and uh, decarbonizing uh, heating. Uh, Anna Vanderspeck is our Electric Vehicle Program Director and will discuss the transportation provisions. I'll discuss uh, electricity and some of the big, uh, uh, big picture issues. So uh, we have a number of people signed up for this, so everyone's muted to avoid background noise, uh, but we welcome questions. You can uh, type them into the question box on your screen. We'll answer all the questions at the end. If we don't have time, we will uh, answer them by email to everybody uh, after the webinar. We'll share the slides and the recording as well. So here's our outline for tonight. We're gonna to talk about the big picture. Uh, we're gonna give you information that you may have heard, but we, we uh, want you to get excited about what this all means for us, um, what it means for the planet, and what it means for all of us. Uh, transportation, heating in buildings, electric power, some other issues um, that are important, but are sort of separate from those sectors. And then what do we do next? So here, uh, the first thing to talk about is the investments. Um, it's estimated that uh, the Inflation Reduction Act will cost the Treasury $369 billion uh, in budget spending plus tax credits. Um, Transportation will get 29 billion. Building efficiency, which Lowy will talk about, it will get 36 billion. Most of the spending will be on electric power, which is 214 billion. Uh, but what's important to note is that the tax credits really will depend upon um, consumer activity and business activity. Uh, the more that we buy in the area of clean energy um, could change the price tag. But um, what we know is the more clean energy we buy, the lower the emissions will be, and actually a lot of the consumer savings in the end will be higher. Next slide. Uh, this slide shows how dramatic the increase in spending per year that's gonna result from the Inflation Reduction Act, plus the Infrastructure Investment Act that was uh, passed last year, plus the more recently uh, passed CHIPS Act. That's the one that was signed to uh, make sure the United States produced more computer chips because there's such a shortage of those in the world. And so you can see what a uh, amount of difference we're, we're making compared to the last few years, but mostly compared to say 1990 and 2000. Uh, so it's a dramatic new level of investment in clean energy. And so we looked at where are the emissions reductions gonna come from? Overall, it's uh, a lot of the experts all agree that we'll probably get 40% greenhouse gas reduction from uh, by 2030. A good chunk of that will come from the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Some of it was already uh, committed, um, and so as you can see, most of the uh, the big items, power, electric power, will pr produce 37% of the total emission reductions, transportation, another 29, and so on. Um, the point that we wanna make is states that do a good job preparing and organizing can maximize benefits. Uh, both Massachusetts and Rhode Island where we work have emission reduction laws, 
50% uh, by 2030 for Massachusetts, 45% for Rhode Island. So we're, we're ahead of the United States goal, uh, but this act will make it easier uh, for us to accomplish that. And actually we should try to go further. Uh, but the, the, the laws we've already committed to in Massachusetts and Rhode Island suddenly are gonna cost us less because of the federal law. Um, here's a chart, you'll get all the slides in an email. And so this is a little bit busy, but it shows you the dramatic uh, savings we're going to have in terms of uh, health benefits, avoided problems regarding getting sick and dying, uh, premature mortality, uh, as well as avoided climate damages. Just think of all the flooding and the wildfires and so on. Um, it can be uh, calculated by economists and, and the price tag kind of makes the $369 billion investment look like a pretty good deal before we even get to some of the more uh, understandable benefits in a few minutes. Next. So here's you know what, how it's gonna affect our pocketbook. These are two different analyses that are basically telling the same story. One analysis says that um, you know we're going to save $79 or $80 per year uh, in 2030, um, and that's as a result of changes in what we spend on electricity, what we spend on transportation, and what we spend on uh, heating our homes. Um, the slide on the right kind of breaks it down a little bit more in terms of the components of electricity, home energy, and mobility or, or transportation. Um, and, and so we're optimistic that uh, we'll be able to garner um, uh, quite a bit of, of savings. The, the point is we can have our cake and eat it too. The more clean energy we have, the better it will be for the economy. Next slide. Now, environmental justice is important to this organization uh, to uh, many people, many organizations. Uh, we're excited by at least three components of the bill. One is that solar projects that benefit low-income people will get a huge boost uh, in a few different ways, which we'll go over in a bit. Um, Lowy in particular will go over the big home electrification incentives that will are targeted to low and moderate income families. We're talking heat pumps, we're talking about increasing uh, electric service in somebody's home. Uh, induction stoves and so forth. Um, and and there's, a, there's targeted spending for people who need it the most. And then there's a very exciting new green bank or greenhouse gas reduction fund with $27 billion behind it. Next slide. Uh, so this slide's pretty interesting. Um, what it says here is that um, the added wind and solar and the energy efficiency that we're gonna get from from the Inflation Reduction Act is going to put downward pressure on average retail electricity prices. So that's separate from the benefit of, of receiving the tax credit if you're somebody involved in a project. What happened, and the reason that is, is the wind and solar is gonna displace and push off natural gas and also oil and coal from the grid. Those are more expensive uh, to uh, operate than a wind and solar project. Once you get it up and running, the fuel is free. And so what this shows, this graph is, uh, you know, the, the graph in the middle there is showing what they expect natural gas prices to be. Uh, but the, the greatest benefit is if natural gas prices for some reason are very high in the next 10 years, that'll add, that'll increase the advantage of having the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, and so it'll help uh, moderate uh, volatility in electricity prices, and it's just going to benefit us. So basically, we'll win whether natural gas prices are low or high, and the difference is uh, is greatest um, if natural gas prices are high. Area it, people in uh, areas where that are vulnerable to high natural gas prices, which I think we would include Massachusetts and Rhode Island, will benefit quite a bit. And now I'll turn it over to uh, Anna, who's an expert on transportation, and she will run through the next few slides. Thank you, Larry, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, I will start with a big picture on what is included in the transportation section of the IRA, um, but then I will spend most of my time talking about the federal tax credit because that is what most directly impacts consumers in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. 
So big picture, uh, there is a lot of funding in the Inflation Reduction Act for transportation related uh, investments, and I'll go over those in the next slide. In addition, for the first time ever, there is a production tax credit for US battery manufacturing. The value of this credit uh, is dependent on the kilowatt hours worth of output uh, that any particular manufacturer puts out in the United States. Um, but the, the reason this is so exciting is that right now, the reason uh, the price of electric vehicles is still on average higher than the price of equivalent gas powered cars is the cost of producing the battery. So this production tax credit can help bring down the cost of producing that battery and therefore hasten the day when we'll reach uh, cost parity between electric vehicles and gas powered cars. Um, so that is definitely good news. The IRA also extends and changes the tax credit for new EVs, which is what I'll spend the majority of my time on today. It also, for the first time, establishes a new tax credit for used EVs, which is very exciting as well as establishing a new tax credit for commercial EVs. Uh, commercial vehicles are a huge chunk of the vehicles on our roads that are uh, polluting all the time, so it's really exciting to see the federal tax credit extend to commercial vehicles, both passenger vehicles and medium and heavy duty vehicles. The details of that is that the value of the tax credit is 30% uh, of the sales price or the incremental cost of an electric vehicle over an equivalent gas powered car, whichever is lesser. And it's capped at $7,500 for vehicles under 14,000 pounds and $14,000 for vehicles over 14,000 pounds. So we are really excited to see this whole spread uh, of new policy, but the commercial EVs piece in particular will complement um, what we've already had and what is now uh, new and changed on the individual side, but we'll go into all of this in more detail. For transportation funding, uh, the big sort of line items are on this table on the left. So the IRA sets out $20 billion in loans for new clean vehicle manufacturing plants. Um, when I talk about the new clean vehicle credit, the new federal tax credit, uh, a big chunk of that time will be spent on talking about new manufacturing requirements for both the vehicles and the batteries. So that is uh, one, one side of the coin. And the other side of the coin is this funding to help bring clean vehicle manufacturing plants to the United States. In addition to those $20 billion, there's $2 billion in grants for revamping existing auto plants so that they can produce electric vehicles instead of fossil fuel powered ones. And then you might have also have heard there's $3 billion for uh, the electrification of the postal service fleet, uh, $3 billion for cleaning up equipment at ports. Um, often the equipment at ports is diesel powered and particularly nasty in terms of uh, localized air pollution and harm to human health. So we're really glad to see that targeted. And then there's $1 billion uh, to support the electrification of trucks and buses, uh, which are also some of the worst offenders when it comes to public health emissions. So we're, we're glad to see all of this on the table. Moving right along, to the clean vehicle credit. This is the federal tax credit and there are lots of changes, um, but I will hopefully go through them in a way that they make sense. So the first thing is that the new federal tax credit goes into effect uh, in 2023. So on January 1st, it's valid now through 2032. Uh, so instead of the current system where the federal tax credit phases out when a manufacturer has sold 200,000 units. Uh, at this point, or starting on January 1st, the federal tax credit will just be in place from 2023 to 2032, regardless of how many vehicles any particular manufacturer sells. So the lifting of that cap means that some manufacturers that currently don't have a federal tax credit available, like General Motors and Tesla, will be back in the game once uh, these changes take effect. In addition, there are now new income requirements. So up until now, there haven't been any income requirements for the federal tax credit, but starting in 2023, you can only qualify if your income is less than $150,000 if you're an individual filer, 
or less than $300,000 if you are filing jointly. The clean vehicle credit has uh, also been expanded to now cover fuel cell vehicles. That's one of the reasons why it's now called the clean vehicle credit instead of the federal tax credit for electric cars. And then the final uh, big new thing is that there are lots of new requirements on the vehicle itself. And I will ro roll right along to the next slide to talk about those. So essentially there are three new requirements for vehicles. The first is that the final assembly location has to be in North America in order for a vehicle to qualify for the federal tax credit. This provision has actually already kicked in. This kicked in the day that President Biden signed the IRA into law. Um, so the list of vehicles that qualify for the federal tax credit has been shortened uh, for the rest of 2022. And we'll go through that in a little bit more detail in a couple of slides. The second new requirement is that the vehicle has to meet a price cap. So for SUVs, pickup trucks, and vans, the vehicle has to cost less than $80,000 to qualify for the federal tax credit. And for sedans and hatchbacks, it has to cost less than $55,000 to qualify. This price cap kicks in in 2023. So for the rest of the year, it's not in place, but it will be in place starting on January 1st. And finally, there's a third uh, bucket of requirements, uh, which are all about the batteries, specifically where the minerals come from and where the battery components are manufactured. This kicks in in 2023 as well, but then from 2023 through 2032, uh, those requirements ramp up. So from now until the end of 2022, a vehicle only has to meet the first requirement, the assembly location, but starting in 2023, a vehicle has to meet all three requirements to qualify for the federal tax credit. That battery component that I just mentioned is actually has two parts. So the first is uh, around the minerals specifically. So starting in 2023, 40% of the battery's minerals by value must be mined or processed in North America or a country with a free trade agreement with the United States or recycled in the US. So all of those ores are there intentionally. Uh, they're supposed to make it easier for a manufacturer to meet this requirement, but it is definitely a, a complicated one. And right now, uh, we don't actually know which vehicles meet this requirement, but by January 1st, uh, hopefully we will. If a vehicle meets this requirement, then it qualifies for a 3750 uh, federal tax credit. Part two of the battery requirement is that is around the battery components. So not specifically the minerals, um, but the components of the battery itself. Here, starting in 2023, the value of the battery components manufactured or assembled in North America must be at least 50% of the battery value. If a vehicle meets this requirement, then it also qualifies for $3,750 in the federal tax credit. So if a vehicle meets only one of these uh, requirements, that's the federal tax credit value. If it meets both, then it qualifies for the full $7,500. Uh, this replaces the current way of calculating how much any particular vehicle qualifies for. Up until now uh, and through the end of 2022, the value has been based on the capacity of the battery. Um, but starting in 2032, excuse me, starting in 2023, uh, this is the new formula that determines how much any particular vehicle qualifies for. As I mentioned, those two battery requirements ramp up over time. The intention here is to give uh, vehicle manufacturers and battery manufacturers enough time to adjust their supply chains uh, and take advantage of those loans and grants to bring manufacturing uh, into the United States. Um, but you can see from this uh, graph that starting in 2027, uh, the critical mineral percentage caps out at 80 percent and starting in 2029 the battery component uh, reaches 100 percent. So this is the schedule that manufacturers now have to hold themselves to if they want their vehicles to qualify for the federal tax credit. 
There's one more piece to this battery uh, element, and that is a foreign entities of concern clause. So everything I've talked about up until now has been that a minimum percentage of the minerals or the battery components have to be made in the, the US or North America. But starting in 2024, if any of the battery components come from a foreign entity of concern, then that vehicle no longer qualifies for the federal tax credit. In 2025, if any of the critical minerals in the batteries come from a foreign entity of concern, the vehicle again does not qualify for the federal tax credit. So exactly what that list of foreign entities of concern looks like is not yet clear, but it's pretty widely expected that Russia and China will be on that list. And those are both countries where a huge amount of the current uh, mineral processing happens and manufacturing happens. So starting in 2024 and 2025, you can still purchase vehicles that have either battery components or critical minerals from these foreign entities of concern. They just won't qualify for the federal tax credit. Moving away from the sort of complicated battery requirements, we'll talk about something exciting, which is the fact that used vehicles now qualify for the federal tax credit. Um, one piece of good news is that the battery requirements do not apply for the used uh, car credit. However, there are some requirements that you should know about. So the first is that the value of the credit for used vehicles is $4,000 or 30% of the sales price, whichever is lower. In order to access the clean vehicle credit for a used car, you have to buy the vehicle from a dealership. The vehicle itself must be at least two years old and cost less than $25,000. And the credit only applies at the first resale. So if you are buying a vehicle uh, that was previously sold new, uh, you can qualify for this federal tax credit. But then if after two years you sell that vehicle to someone else, um, they won't be able to take advantage of the used vehicle tax credit because it's already been used once for that particular vehicle. And then finally, there's a lower income threshold for people who want to take advantage of this tax credit. Um, and it basically cuts the income cap in half. So joint filers have to make less than $150,000 per year and individual filers less than $75,000. One other piece that we're really excited about is that starting in 2024, so one year later, um, the tax credit should be available at the point of sale. Uh, the language in the bill says that the consumer starting in 2024 can choose to transfer the tax credit to the dealership. Exactly how that's going to work is still TBD. We don't have any details on the process either from the uh, individual point of view or from the dealer point of view. Um, but this is exciting for two reasons. One, uh, it makes this federal tax credit accessible to people who otherwise couldn't shell out a couple thousand dollars and then wait nine months to get reimbursed. Um, by making it available at the point of sale, you're opening up uh, this vehicle technology to more people. Um, and secondly, it makes the credit available for people who might not have accessed it under the current system, because right now, how much you can take advantage of is limited by your personal tax liability. So if you don't owe federal taxes, you can't really take advantage of the federal tax credit. But with this point of sale option moving in 2024, um, the tax credit should be available to um, more people independent of their personal tax liability. So those are two reasons we're really excited about this, but we will be keeping our eyes and ears out in the next year uh, to get the details on exactly how this will work. Uh, that was all a lot of information. Um, so I will do my best to summarize it here in a timeline. So first is that starting August 16th, when President Biden signed the IRA, the assembly location requirement kicked in. Starting at the beginning of 2023, all of the new requirements uh, follow. So that is the income requirement, the vehicle price cap, the battery requirements, those all kick in. 
um, the manufacturer cap disappears, which brings back the credit for some of the manufacturers uh, who have phased out so far, um, and the credit becomes available for used cars. At the beginning of 2024, one of the foreign entity of concern requirements kicks in. This one is about the vehicle, um, and the point of sale option uh, should become available. From then until 2032, the battery requirements ramp up over time. And at the beginning of 2025, the last piece kicks in, and that is the battery for an entity of concern requirements. So this uh, is big picture, the changes that are in store for the federal tax credit. Uh, this uh, is confusing and has left a lot of people wondering uh, what vehicles are eligible now and will be eligible in the future. Um, and we will summarize this in basically three buckets. So there are some vehicles that had been eligible, um, but are now no longer eligible for the federal tax credit because their final assembly does not take place in North America. Um, so this unfortunately includes some really popular, uh, longer range, more affordable battery electric vehicles that people are really excited about. Uh, so in this category, we have uh, the Hyundai Ioniq 5, the Kia EV6, the new Nissan Aria, the Toyota BZ4X, a lot of the vehicles that we feature in our Cars Coming Soon webinar every quarter are unfortunately in this bucket. The second bucket is that some vehicles are eligible now, uh, but they will become ineligible starting in 2023, um, either because of the price or because they don't meet the battery requirements. Uh, a big caveat is that we don't know which vehicles will and will not meet the battery requirements piece. That's something that uh, the manufacturers have to prove to the federal government between now and January 1st. Um, but we do know some vehicles that won't be eligible um, because their price is above the price cap. Uh, so particular trim or package levels for the Ford F-150 Lightning, the Rivian R1S and the R1T and the Tesla Model X and Model Y are all in this bucket. They are above the price cap, so starting on January 1st, they will no longer be eligible. Then there's a third and smaller bucket, which is that some vehicles will become newly eligible because of the lifting of the 200,000 unit cap. So starting January 1st, we expect, for example, the Chevy Bolt to become eligible for the federal tax credit again, um, because it is assembled in North America uh, and it is under the price cap. So as long as it meets the battery requirements, uh, it should be eligible again. Uh, if you have a particular vehicle in mind, uh, we have a blog post where we wrote out all of these details, but also included lists of vehicles in each of these three buckets. Um, so if you're thinking of a particular car, you can find the one that you're thinking of and get a sense of where it falls. Um, and we'll send out the link to this blog as well, but it's a good written out summary basically of all the things that uh, I've discussed so far today. So there are a couple of unknowns still that will impact uh, exactly, that will change the impact of this federal tax credit in the coming years. Uh, the first is that we don't know uh, what vehicles existing and also new models uh, will meet the 2023 battery requirements. So we don't have a definitive list of models that will be eligible as of January 1st. Uh, we really hope to get that in the coming months, but this is one of the, the big unknowns. The second is uh, that lots of manufacturers purchase or uh, build themselves batteries at different plants all across the globe. And so it's unclear what's going to happen uh, if batteries for the same vehicle are manufactured in multiple locations. If you go to the Federal Department of Energy's website right now and look at the vehicles that are eligible now because they meet the final assembly location uh, requirement, you'll see that the DOE directs you to a VIN decoder, a vehicle identification number decoder, basically a tool where you can type in uh, basically your vehicle's social security number and find out where exactly it was put together. So that lets you find out if any particular vehicle you're looking at was assembled in the United States 
Um, but it's going to be interesting to see if a similar tool uh, exists to check where the battery was manufactured. So that is something that will have to be sorted out in the next couple of months. And then finally, uh, we don't know exactly how the point of sale credit will work. Uh, we have an extra year to figure that one out because it doesn't kick in until 2024. Um, but that's something that will be important to us to figure out both for consumers, but also the car dealers in our network. Um, we all need to know how that will work. So we'll keep our eyes out for all of this. Um, I will shortly turn the mic over to my colleague, Loey, but I wanted to mention one more thing, which is that the IRA also includes a tax credit for installing charging. So the IRA includes a 10-year extension of a 30% tax credit for installing EV charging. For individuals, that's $1,000 or 30% uh, of the cost, whichever is less. And for commercial installations, it's 30% up to $100,000. Um, this target is really intended to increase EVSE or EV charging installations in rural and low income communities because we know that um, those are places where charging hasn't been built out as fast, which means fewer people can make the switch to an electric car. And one thing we're really excited about is that the tax credit covers bi-directional chargers. So these are chargers that not only take power from the grid and put it into a vehicle's battery, but that are also capable of taking um, power out of a vehicle's battery and discharging it back onto the grid to help uh, balance supply and demand and uh, achieve the peak cut down uh, energy demand on peak days, which reduces costs for everybody and also emissions disproportionately. So we're really excited about that piece. And with that, I will turn it over to Loie to talk about buildings and uh, efficiency and heating. Hi there. Um, you can go on to the next slide, Anna. Um, there's a lot in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act that will be uh, release funds for improvements in buildings. Um, the biggest two sectors are tax credits. Uh, then there's some rebates. The rebate programs will go through the, the tax credits will apply in 2022. So anything done this year uh, will will be covered by the tax credits. The rebate programs will start up sometime in 2023. Um, because those need to go through the states, so uh, there needs to be a lot of administrative work that's done there in preparation. Uh, then there's a new construction. Uh, there's money for new construction. Uh, there's money for retrofits of affordable housing, for states to adopt uh, new building codes, more efficient building codes, uh, commercial uh, construction, uh, construction of commercial buildings. Um, it retrofits to federal buildings and uh, training for contractors, uh, energy efficiency and electrification of contractors. Next slide, please. So the first uh, tax credit is one, both of the tax credits are basically extending credits that would have expired this year. Um, so the, uh, the residential clean energy tax credit um, makes gives you a 30 percent uh, tax credit um, for investments that you make in certain uh, clean energy um, production and storage uh, capabilities geothermal heat pump solar photovoltaics solar water heating and for the first time home battery storage uh, so that's exciting and this goes for 10 years and then gradually declines go ahead the second tax credit um, increases an existing tax from 10% to 30%, and uh, it removes the lifetime cap. This is really important because uh, that gives you basically a 10-year window to plan all sorts of energy efficiency um, for your home, knowing that you're going to be able to take this um, uh, this credit every year, you know, that you make some improvement. Uh, so that's really exciting. 
and this includes $2,000 for heat pumps. It also includes uh, fossil fuel equipment, but that fossil fuel equipment has to be much more efficient than what it's replacing. Uh, go ahead for the next one. Um, the uh, first of the two rebates is the HOMES program. And uh, this is based, the, the amount of the rebate is, is based on projected energy savings. So, you know, you have an idea for your house, it involves, you know, either a single or multiple things that you're going to install. And some professional, and I'm not sure whether it will be a HERS rater or simply a contractor, um, will take a look at what's being proposed, will model your current energy use, will measure your current energy use, and then will model or project what your energy use will be after the new energy efficiency measure has been done. So that's going to be your savings. And the uh, rebate is broken into a couple different tiers. You see here in the graph a dark green, which is the 20 to 35% savings, and then a light green, which is 35% savings or more. So that's the reduction in your total energy usage that this retrofit that you're going to apply this rebate to. Um, now, uh, any income level can take advantage of this this uh, this rebate um, and get 50% of their project cost paid for. If you are a low income household or if the property you are renovating is occupied by a low income household, then the uh, project will pay for up to 80% of the project cost and the uh, the caps uh, are 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 increased. There is, as you can also do this with a, a multifamily building, and uh, again, the amount of the rebate depends on who's occupying those particular units, um, and uh, uh, there's a cap for for the total number that that a multifamily can apply for. And again, this starts in 2023 and it has to go through the state. So uh, we don't know exactly when in 2023 it will start because there has to be you know, all sorts of administrative stuff done uh, before they can start handing out the money. Next slide. So the second uh, rebate is specifically targeted to what are termed low and moderate income households. So these, you will have to, uh, uh, share income information in order to qualify for this. Um, there are two levels. The, the low income is is 80% AMI. AMI is area median income. And I'll talk a little bit about that, or I'll show a couple examples of that on the next slide. Um, but 80% or less of area median income, you can get up to 100% of the cost paid. So as you see in the graph, this $8,000 for a heat pump, you could put an $8,000 heat pump into a, a home occupied or, or owned by uh, somebody who's low income, and the, the rebate would pay that full 8000 Now, if your income is between 80% and 150% of area median income, sorry, there's an I missing there, um, you would get up to 50% up to of the cost. So that $8,000 rebate would only, the full amount of that $8,000 would only be available to you if the heat pump cost $16,000. There is a gap of uh, $14,000 per unit, so you can do multiples of these things. For instance, you could get insulation and air sealing plus electric wiring plus a panel upgrade plus a heat pump. That would total about $16,000. So in a Low income household, you'd be able to get the full 14,000. In a moderate income household, you would get half of that 16,000, so about 8,000 if you did those four things uh, you know, with these prices. Again, this does start in 2023. It will be administrated by, administered by all the states. And so we don't know when in 2023 it will start. Um, uh, but hopefully sometime it will. 
2023. Note that this can't be combined, that this particular um, incentive can't be combined with other federal or state incentives. So for instance, if you got a mass save heat pump uh, rebate, you couldn't also get this uh, federal rebate. Um, and and ditto with the with the earlier rebate program that I described. You can't uh, combine the two rebate programs. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So a little bit about how the states are determining uh, income eligibility. Uh, we don't know exactly yet what eligibility criteria they will use, but uh, one of them might be it might be the Fannie Mae. Uh, which is what HUD uses. And uh, fortunately, Fannie Mae has this nice uh, area immediate income lookup tool. Um, and you can put in your address and it will tell you what the area median income is and a few other facts about that, about that address. Uh, in Providence, the area median income is about $100,000 and thus the $150,000 cap is about 150,000. In Boston, the area median income is 133, and thus the 150 is about 200,000. So that's just, just to give you a ballpark. And then again, to remind you, states uh, may very well use other income guidelines, um, and they may include number of persons in the household as one of the factors to determine income eligibility. Uh, it hasn't been spelled out yet, but this gives you a ballpark. Next slide, please. Uh, just some of the smaller um, uh, parts of the uh, IRA for buildings. There's a billion dollars for affordable housing. This covers not only efficiency, but also climate resilience and notably benchmarking. So uh, for instance, for the uh, states and municipalities that are instituting benchmarking requirements, um, uh, that is public reporting of your energy usage, uh, your building's energy usage. Uh, this will uh, you'll, you could potentially apply for grants uh, to help with this, and it will also there'll be some funding for HUD to work with uh, uh, specifically the HUD buildings. Um, there's money for new construction, both in residential and commercial, uh, two billion for residential, and this includes manufactured homes, uh, otherwise known as mobile homes, um, and um, a third of a billion um, for commercial uh, buildings. Uh, this includes buildings being built by nonprofits, um, and there's an added bonus, uh, there's a per square foot, uh, formula for for distribution of this uh, $362 million. And uh, if if the building is built with prevailing wage labor, uh, then there's a bonus uh, square foot. There's also some money for contractor training uh, by states, and there's money for the federal building upgrades. And finally, uh, efficient buildings, uh, efficient building codes, uh, as you can see from this map, there's a real hodgepodge of uh, building codes in this country. And so there's going to be federal monies that will help um, states or other entities uh, uh, upgrade their building codes. Uh, uh, one third of that for just anybody moving up in any code, adopting any new code, and then two thirds of a, of a billion for those that are instituting um, stretch codes or zero energy codes. Um, so a lot of good things going on in here. And um, uh, I will turn it over to Larry to talk about the electric grid. Uh, thank you, Loie. Um, so folks, uh, Anna explained to you how it seems to be national policy now to uh, get us to electrify transportation. Um, and that's where a lot of the emission reductions are gonna come from. And that's where a lot of the bill savings are gonna come from because it's cheaper to run a car on electricity than on gasoline. Um, then uh, Lowy explained that it seems to be policy now 
uh, to electrify buildings and heat with uh, heat pumps and so forth. And so let's now talk about how we're going to make sure that we have a good, strong, uh, clean electric grid. Uh, so according to the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, we've got about 240 million uh, solar panels in existence in the United States. And in 2030, we're going to have four times that many. That's pretty exciting. Uh, a lot of people love solar. You're going to see a lot more of it because of the Inflation Reduction Act. Next slide. Battery storage. Uh, we love seeing wind and solar, um, and there's so many benefits to them. They're renewable, they're clean, um, and they're getting better all the time, but there are times when we're going to need battery storage. Battery storage has uh, improved technologically uh, at an amazing rate, and so right now you can see in 2021, we didn't have a whole lot, and uh, we're going to have a a lot in 2030, uh, big huge increase as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act. We'd be moving along um, with current policies, but the Inflation uh, Reduction Act uh, more than doubles our commitment to battery storage. Wind turbines, this is showing how many wind turbines will be operating. We're going to be uh, more than doubling uh, our uh, production of wind turbines throughout the United States uh, because of the Inflation Reduction Act. So we like, you know, that that's just, you're gonna see that throughout the entire country. Next slide. <clears throat> just another way to look at it, same information really, from a different source showing on the left-hand side, uh, the orange section is how much more solar that is. I believe that's 35% as a result of uh, the Inflation Reduction Act on the right-hand side, that increment for that's onshore wind is coming about as a result of um, the act. So it's about a 50% increase. Uh, the tax credits that have come into play, Lowy talked about uh, the residential solar tax credits, but in addition, there's a renewable energy production tax credit of 51 billion. It's gonna go to wind and solar and other resources. A clean electricity investment tax credit of 51 billion, um, and again they're going to be at 30% until 2032. Then it ramps down, but not out. 26% in 2033, 24% in 2035. That gives it all of us, consumers and um, project developers, and uh, the manufacturers of these uh, materials to to uh, plan. We've got all this time, and so we can be more aggressive. Um, and what we're very excited about is they're they're going to bring in what's called direct pay for tax exempt entities. Nonprofits and municipalities have been unable to take advantage of these tax credits. Uh, the way they've been written over the years, you have to have a uh, a tax liability in order to get that 30% value. Uh, but now nonprofits like Green Energy Consumers Alliance and your city and town and the state government uh, will be able to um, directly invest in a project and get those hefty tax credits. And what we're really excited about is the bottom uh, bullet. There's a 20% bonus tax credit if the project is located in a low-income community or benefits low-income people. So we're really talking about a 50% tax credit for certain projects. I, we can easily envision uh, solar projects um, in a low-income community or benefiting low-income people and getting a 50% tax credit um, plus you know, state incentives at the Massachusetts and Rhode Island uh, levels. And uh, you can even see that happening uh, with wind projects and offshore wind projects. Next uh, slide. So speaking of offshore, um, one uh, company called Rystad question whether or not there would be enough uh, supply of wind turbine installation vessels uh, to uh, take full uh, advantage of the tax credits for to uh, put out more offshore wind projects. Um, I'm not sure they're correct on that. I just wanted to put it out there. Um, however, I want to point out Massachusetts and Rhode Island already have committed to several projects that are under development right now. The first one coming online 
uh, in a big way will be Vineyard Wind in about, I think, a year and a half. Um, and then we've got Revolution Wind, we've got Mayflower Wind, and uh, several more. Both states have recently committed to procuring more wind power. So now we've got this uh, Inflation Reduction Act that gives us reasons to um, accelerate our commitment to offshore wind and get a hold of these hefty tax credits. Next slide. Transmission is very important uh, to both states. Um, it's uh, kind of complicated to transmit the power from offshore wind uh, to uh, the load centers where we use all our electricity along I-95, uh, but it can be done. That is a shorter stretch of wire than uh, where we get a lot of our power right now, certainly from Canada or from New York or from Maine. Um, and so there's $2 billion in there to, uh, in transmission loans. And then um, what I know that uh, Senator Markey pushed uh, was $100 million to help planning on an interregional basis. Um, want to give a shout out to Senator Markey and Senator Whitehouse of Rhode Island, Senator Warren of Massachusetts and Senator Reed of uh, Rhode Island. They plus the congressional delegations were really strong supporters of the Inflation Reduction Act and uh, their work uh, is, is embedded throughout the entire act. They had a lot of good ideas that got kept. Um, so that's not a huge commitment to transmission um, in the big picture, but uh, we'll be in a position to benefit from it. So there are some other issues besides electricity, besides building and besides uh, transportation. We'll go to those. Uh, there's a agency that a lot of people don't realize. It's the Department of Energy's Loan Programs Office, and uh, it was established uh, in 2005 uh, to lend money to innovative clean energy projects. Um, and you know, quite frankly, it got a little bit of uh, support during uh, the Bush administration. The Obama administration used it more. Donald Trump's office did not use it much. So there's already some existing resources where they can make loans to help uh, reduce the interest rate uh, and to reduce the risk of a lot of clean energy projects. But this Inflation Reduction Act adds more money to the pot, $40 billion more in loan guarantee authority. Um, so the idea is that the loan office might see a big project and they may not loan directly to the project, but they will guarantee the loan, a bank, will make the loan. Um, and so they, they're sort of the uh, lender uh, backstop to the whole project. That can help reduce the interest rate that the bank would charge. Um, plus you get the tax credits and plus you've got all these grants. So projects are going to be uh, more viable and you'll this is critical uh, to reduce the cost of the power. And not just the power, that could also support um, a municipality or uh, the MBTA or any regional transit authority uh, buying buses um, that could help uh, underwrite the cost of affordable, green affordable housing uh, and many other things. It's not just for electricity production. Then uh, another thing we're excited about, this is also an idea that uh, Senator Markey had a lot to do with, which was it's a $27 billion uh, greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, also known as a Green Bank, and its uh, idea is to provide low-cost financing. Um, it's different from that loan office that I referred to before um, for clean energy infrastructure projects, um, and there's a couple of uh, set-asides, $7 billion for states and tribes to provide grants and loans for low-income folks and disadvantaged, um, but then there's a separate $8 billion to finance low-income and disadvantaged communities, so it would be located within the community, and then $12 billion in general assistance. Um, so we're pretty excited. This is one of the elements that makes uh, this a an environmental justice component. Um, a lot of folks are going to benefit. Uh, it's targeted to low and moderate income folks, people of color, uh, people who have been uh, overburdened and underserved for a long, long time. So now what? This is where we look to you. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act doesn't mean a thing unless we take advantage of it. So we can take advantage of it at home, in our cities and towns, and in our states of Massachusetts and Rhode Island. 
So first, for those of us who uh, own or rent, uh, run, don't walk to this calculator that's set up by Rewiring America. You can plug in your zip code, whether you own or rent, what your household income is, whether you file as a single person, jointly or as a married couple, uh, and then what your household size is. And it will tell you what your, um, which rebates and tax credits you can take advantage of for your home. Uh, Sarah Ross, a good friend of ours, uh, made a social media post that said, if you go to this, it essentially tells you what you have in your clean energy bank account. That's money there for the taking. You just have to match it with some of your own dollars. Um, or maybe if you're uh, below 80% of median income, it'll tell you what you can get for free. Um, so uh, what we're saying here is um, how much we benefit in Massachusetts and Rhode Island or anywhere in the country is gonna depend on how many people uh, are taking advantage of the generous incentives for home clean energy. But then moving on, uh, cities and towns. Um, start planning now, um, no matter what uh, economic condition your, your community is, there's something there for you. Um, and as I said before, the, the um, direct pay concept will make um, public projects um, putting solar on schools or changing out the, the heating system in a uh, public school you know, a whole lot cheaper. It's gonna help do storage um, in a community. It's gonna help with the, uh, again, the electric school buses um, and, and, and things like that. You can, so what I, where's our strong suggestion, the cities and towns should get to work now before 2023. Start identifying sites where you can do projects maybe consider hiring consultants, maybe doing a re request for proposal to hire partners uh, or to, to partner up with uh, companies in other cities and towns that might go in on a project with you. Learn what the rules are as they come out to determine what areas of your community, if any, are eligible for those uh, uh, rebates and tax incentives for low and moderate income areas. Um, I really strongly believe this, that if a community was to spend 100,000 or 200,000 right now, this fall, to prepare for the Inflation Reduction Act, that would be money well spent. That'll help, the, the return on investment would be huge. Um, I guess one of the points we wanna make, I think Lowy alluded to it, a lot of the rules about how to play the, the game are, are being written in Washington right now you're gonna hear from the Department of Energy, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Department of Transportation, the Internal Revenue Service. That's gonna take some time. And then the states are gonna to have to learn what their role is. A lot of this will be um, filtered down through the states. So the Massachusetts Energy Office, the Rhode Island Energy Office also better get to work. So that's our next slide. Um, we have a long list of recommendations from them. It's lean in, both Massachusetts and Rhode Island have laws that say we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. It's 50% by 2030 in Massachusetts, it's 45% in Rhode Island. The Inflation Reduction Act makes it easier and cheaper to do it, but only if we capture the benefits. Again, same idea, states should invest dollars, staff up if you need to, to um, find out what's going on with the forthcoming federal rules. Any money spent this year will uh, leverage many times more money from Washington. Um, find state and local projects that are shovel ready. You've got time. I mean, we actually have 10 years, but why not hit the ground running in 2023, right? Um, the, uh, some federal grants are gonna be awarded on a competitive basis. They're just not gonna drop the money to cities and towns and states uh, from the sky. So grant writers get to work, um, find out what the priorities are. Um, and so again, there would be a high rate of return on anything we do now. And in particular, you know, right now, we don't have the workforce that's needed to fulfill our goals in energy and climate. Uh, but that's a good problem to have. We can start putting more people to work than ever uh, we need to give them the job training and the education that they need. Um, and, and the Inflation Reduction Act is telling us uh, across the board, whether it's 
um, there's a lot of workforce development funds or tax credits that are geared towards getting uh, projects done uh, by prevailing wage, which general, generally means uh, good, high-paying uh, jobs, apprenticeships, so people can learn uh, to become a uh, a full uh, tradesperson. Um, so we, the states, need to invest in workforce development. Uh, we need more people to build the charging stations and to install the heat pumps and to um, put up the solar panels and the wind turbines. There's just no doubt, doubt about that. So um, I know both states are looking at workforce development. What the Inflation Reduction Act is, say, whatever you were thinking, triple it. Next slide. I uh, want to put in a commercial. We're basically done with the, with the content. We'll be answering questions. But I have to tell you, this is our 40th year as an organization. Um, we'd love to see you at our fall meeting. It's outdoors. It's October 3rd. It's going to be a beautiful night from 5 to 7.30. It's at a place called the Lawn on D over by the World Trade Center in Boston. Um, you can buy a ticket uh, at Eventbrite from us. Um, and we'll be sending all these slides and all the links off to you uh, very shortly so you can do that. Next slide. Um, again, it's our 40th anniversary. Can't tell you that about that enough. Um, if you like the work that we do, um, please donate. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization, and um, you can go to greenenergyconsumers.org slash donate. Um, you just heard from Lowy and from Anna, they are experts in their fields. We've got uh, 15 other experts um, in our offices that are trying to help you speed the transition to clean energy, but we could use your help. Next slide. Uh, if you have questions from tonight and they pertain to electric power, uh, you can send them to me. Uh, if it's transportation, to Anna. If it's buildings and heating, it would be Lowy. Uh, it's our first name at greenenergyconsumers.org. We have a lot of events coming up. Uh, you're going to learn more about solar. We have a partnership with a company called Energy Sage. Um, five ways to you uh, you'll learn about how to save on maintenance in an EV. It's so much cheaper to maintain an EV than a gasoline-powered car. Uh, we've got a car show in Quincy during National Drive Electric Week. Uh, we've got some more webinars about EVs coming up uh, in that week as well. Uh, you can get more information about our events at greenenergyconsumers.org slash events. And next slide. I think that's it, right? So now we will start taking your questions. Anna, do you want to shout them out a little bit? Yes. Um, so we have a couple of questions already. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble opening the questions. Here we go. Um, so one of the top questions I think is, could you explain how the incentives for heat pumps and other energy investments will be applied to housing operated by nonprofits? Uh, my understanding is those tax credits will be uh, available through direct pay to a nonprofit or to a, um, a publicly owned project. And so it and there's other going to be grants and other loans to take advantage there. Um, will the direct pay provision for tax exempt organizations apply to religious institutions? I'm almost certain they will. I'm 99% sure of that one. Um, and then I see one more question. So if you have not submitted a question and have a burning question, send it to us. We could keep talking about this forever, but it's better if we're responding to your actual questions. Um, Loie, I think this question is for you, which is um, you were talking about uh, AMI, air and median income. Uh, and I know that you talked about it will ultimately be up to the state to decide what the the limit is, but the question is whether um, AMI is based on adjusted gross income. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, we'll have to see uh, as the details of the programs get uh, get rolled out. Those I are all the questions I think. With that uncertainty. 
we could talk for an hour just about the uncertainty. <laughs> but we won't. Yeah. Um, folks, we're here for a few more minutes. We were scheduled till um, 8.30, so we do have some more. Um, we have some so questions we, coming in. There's a question about heat pumps and is it retroactive to 2022 installations? Uh, I know the answer on that one is it's not. Um, and I think we're waiting to see if it can be combined with a mass save rebate. Is that true, Loie? I don't believe that it will be combinable with the mass save rebate. Uh, I certainly, for, it, what it could be is that um, this will be interesting and we're going to have more webinars as the information comes out. It may be that you can't double dip um, the rebate for a heat pump from the feds and a rebate from the state. We're not certain about that yet, um, but you might be able to get a tax credit or a rebate from the feds in a in a rebate from Mass Save for something different um, in your house. Yes. And so I think yes. I think there'll be a lot of that. There'll be some strategy involved, and I think you know we're going to try to help with that as we learn more. Um, and Jerry was asking, will the Mass Save rebate continue in 2023? Yes, that's a commitment that the state's already made um, for. Um, um, you know, for at least the next three years. And, and I'm sure it'll continue after that. I'm going to jump in and just make one clarification, which is that on the transportation side, you can stack the federal tax credit with the state rebate for electric vehicles. Both Massachusetts and Rhode Island have a state rebate if you purchase or lease an electric car, and that is stackable on top of the federal tax credit. So that's one distinction between the sectors. And the tax credit can be combined with with state rebates, uh, the federal tax credit, but not. I don't believe the federal uh, federally funded rebates will be stackable with the with the uh, state. You with mean the for existing, heat pumps? For heat pumps, yeah. Yep. Sorry. Uh, Gordon has a question: Are we recommending air source heat pumps or geothermal if you want to re have a 100 replacement? of home heat. Um, Loie, do you want to explain the program that you're doing for us in partnership with Abode Energy Management? Sure. Yeah, we uh, have um, a, a found a wonderful group that offers expert uh, 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 counseling, advising, um, and program management uh, regarding heat pumps. Uh, this is Abode Energy Management, and they actually run heat pump trainings for the Mass Save program and and oversee a lot of administration on on the Mass Save uh, trainings for for contractors uh, for heat pump installers. So we are partnering with them. They have helped us curate a list of trusted vendors. Uh, we can refer you to those vendors. And Abode is also offering discounts on two really important services that we think are going to make a big difference in terms of uh, com consumer protection in the heat pump uh, market. Uh, the first is um, a one hour consultation with a heat pump expert where you can actually outline everything that's happening in your home and they will be able to help you think through what are the issues, what are the options, et cetera. The second service uh, that we are, uh, that Abode is offering at a discount uh, to people who come in through our referral program is a quote comparison. And that is after you have met with some heat pump contractors and received quotes from them for a potential heat pump installation, you can share those quotes with Abode and they will produce a um, very sophisticated report analyzing the equipment, the greenhouse gas reductions, the sizing, um, uh, all sorts of uh, issues, um, and compare those quotes on, a, on an apples to apples side by side basis, uh, which is just extremely valuable and will let you see right away, oh, that contractor really thinks I need way more heat than these other two contractors do, or cooling, or et cetera. Um, 
So it's a really great service. If you're at all familiar with Energy Sage and its solar services, Abode is offering a somewhat similar um, uh, uh, service for heat pump. And, uh, and we think it's really uh, uh, innovative and, uh, and useful for our members. Um, so we encourage you to go to our website and register, and that will, uh, it's a free registration. You can get access to our referral list and the discounts on the other two services. And yes, we do recommend, we do, we do understand that heat pumps can provide 100% of your heating needs, whether or not that's affordable, both in terms of installation and in the ongoing operational costs is something that you know will vary from house to house. And of course, these incentives will make it easier and more affordable for more people. Uh, we have some more questions. We're, we're gonna have to try to go quickly through them to try to, we may not address them all, but uh, Loey, one question is, does the heat pump tax credit include upgrading capacity? Do we know that? Yes. Yes, it does. Uh, there's uh, there's money for uh, both the electric panel and for actual wires, um, you know, wiring circuits, whatever needs to be done. Uh, then uh, somebody was asking, is there a timeline for the federal government to roll out more information, um, which the states then can use to set guidelines? No, there is not a timeline, um, but the the intent of the legislation is to have these things uh, effective on uh, January 1st, 2023 in most cases, um, but it does take time. I think we we need to push the state and also cities and towns to get ready uh, because the when the feds start rolling out information, it'll there'll be a lot and it'll be it'll be it'll have to be complex. We've already talked about how complicated it sounds at a high level. So the level of detail will be quite amazing, um, but it'll come. Um, I think the fall will be um, quite busy and, and exciting. Um, Omar was asking, is it possible, could we repeat the incentives for heat pumps and solar? Um, I guess Omar and everybody else, we will send out um, uh, all the slides, so you'll have those in front of you. Um, we'll send them up by email um, very soon. And just a well, reminder just... about that Rewiring America uh, calculator uh, will uh, allow you to specify your particular location, household income, etc., and that will further drill down what's applicable to your home or your property. Um, Ian is asking, who will administer the federal dollars for the buildings in Massachusetts? Will that be the Department of Energy Resources or another agency? Um, we don't know that yet. Um, we'll be contacting the state and uh, trying to get that information out to everybody as soon as we know. Um, but they're probably trying to, the state, I'm willing to bet you that the state is brainstorming the right approach on this one. We haven't heard yet. Um, let's see. Uh, do the heat pumps incentives include geothermal? Yes, they do, correct, uh, Louis? Yes, I believe so. Uh, certainly the tax credit includes geothermal. Um, let me just check my notes. I, I know the tax credits do, um, and uh, I'm not sure about the, uh, it might be difficult to do the rebates for folks who are 150% of median income or less, it probably wouldn't be enough to, to make a geothermal project happen. Um, getting back to Jerry was asking about heat pumps, is it better to wait for 2023 to get both a federal tax credit and mass save, um, or should he start the installation this year? Um, my my belief, Loie, you could might have a different opinion, is in and I'm looking at it this from my own home. 
I think it would be a good time to get bids this fall and have the work done in 2023 to take advantage of the tax credit and mass save. That's the $2,000 tax credit for, for heat pumps if you're above 150% of, of median income. Um, but just a reminder about the tax credits, um, that's a 30% tax credit. So in order to, to get the full $2,000, you need to spend about six thousand um, dollars and one good thing about it is even though it's capped at two thousand dollars you can get you can apply each year so um, it's now this fall is a good time for people to think about their home uh, think about all the different things you would want to do with that it would be eligible for these tax credits and rebates you may not be able to do them all at once but over the next two three years you could have a good program and that's why we keep encouraging you to look at that rewiring America um, calculator. Yeah, I'll point you to, to two other resources. One is the Mass Clean Energy Center has a uh, a nice planning guide for uh, like making your house go uh, fossil fuel free. Um, so uh, it's basically a checklist of what are all the ways that you use fossil fuels in your home? And when will the equipment that uses that fossil fuel uh, expire? You know, when will it need to be replaced? Your water heater, your whatever it is, your car, et cetera. Um, and you can then start a little calendar of, of investments and, and, and uh, you know, maximize your uh, financial efficiency by replacing equipment as it, becomes obsolete. Another resource that I would point you to is Energy Sage. Um, when we're talking about electrifying your home, obviously you need to think about the cost of the electricity that's going to run all of those things. And if you can uh, supply any of your own solar uh, by installing a solar array um, on your property somewhere, then the cost of that electrification, the, the operating cost, is going to go down significantly. So I recommend that people look at their solar capacity early on, and you can do that um, right, you know, you can start on our website at greenenergyconsumers.org forward slash solar and um, get bids and figure out uh, if you do if you do have capacity and, and want to make that investment. Once you have figured that out, that's going to let you peg in a lower cost for your electricity when you're calculating, am I going to be able to afford switching my heating, say, from a relatively efficient natural gas system to a high efficiency cold climate heat pump, but that nonetheless is going to need kilowatts to run. And you want to know what the price of those kilowatts is in order to make that calculation. Uh, we have another question is, uh, can we explain again how nonprofits and municipalities can take advantage of the uh, tax credits that were mentioned? Um, so what this bill does um, for the first time, it says that um, the 30% credit that would go to a for-profit business um, in the form of a tax credit can also be given to a nonprofit or a municipality in a slightly different format. Um, it's, it's called direct pay, but essentially you're going to get the 30% value just the same. So if the project was a million dollars, um, let's suppose it was a, um, a big solar project uh, in a city or town, um, you could look to the feds for a $300,000, essentially a grant uh, to make it happen. Now, a lot of cities and towns in Massachusetts have installed um, solar through a more complicated way in recent years. Some cities and towns will lease their roof uh, to a solar developer who then takes the tax credit, pays the city or town a lease payment, and probably gives them a good deal on the electricity that's generated by the solar panels but the tax benefit goes all to the uh, to the for-profit developer. And that arrangement is kind of complicated legally. Um, cities and towns and the 
for profit have to uh, hash out the details. Um, and and that still will, will be an option that cities and towns can think about going forward. Um, but uh, now cities and towns have another option. They could um, do a, a municipal bond, for example, to build a project. Um, municipal bonds have very low interest rates, for example. And we may even see fewer, I mean, even fewer lower interest rates in the future because of the Green Bank and uh, the Federal Loan Office that I mentioned. Um, and then the city or town could own the project 100%, get the 30% the direct payment. But again, if it's a project that benefits low-income people or is in a low-income community, it's 50%. And again, that's also to get that full value, Another uh, add another 10% if it hits the trifecta, if it's in a low-income community, and if it's got um, uh, built according to prevailing wage and all that, it ends up getting 60%. Um, so again, this is where I recommend cities and towns um, find the sites and um, do what you need to do to plan it out, knowing that you've got very good financial options ahead of you. And it's not just for, you know, solar on schools it could be for wind turbines it could be for um, storage we can make our communities more resilient by putting in some battery storage um, we could uh, again go to heat pumps we could go to um, uh, school buses we could do a number of things uh, with these uh, tax credits and with the uh, greenhouse gas reduction fund and another note on that uh, commercial buildings, the new construction money for commercial buildings, that um, it's a tax deduction and that tax deduction can be assigned to the developer if the owner of the project is a nonprofit. Uh, so is that as well? Any other questions? Um, you know, I guess we'll say one last time, there's still a lot of uncertainty about how it's all going to work. We have this complicated law, hundreds of pages. Now the federal government has to get its agencies uh, on the ball to write up the rules. The states have to do the same thing, they're, but they're waiting on the feds to some extent. And so um, if, you, if you think that it's simple, you're probably missing something. Because everyone I know, including some uh, high-priced tax lawyers, find it very confusing and, and saying that they can't really say how it's going to work until they see more guidance from the, uh, the feds. So uh, bear with us. I can tell you that uh, here at Green Energy Consumers Alliance, we are going to make it a priority uh, to interpret, help consumers and communities interpret this, uh, because we think um, on the whole, uh, this bill is 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 excellent. It's what we need in order to reach our greenhouse gas reduction goals. It's going to save consumers money. Um, we didn't put up a slide about the job creation because there, uh, I've seen different numbers on that, and it um, it's kind of confusing. But they all point to the fact that it's going to create um, a lot of good jobs, particularly in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. We can see that with um, electricians, um, heat pump installers, and uh, solar installers and the like. And so we're quite excited about it. Uh, the bill's not perfect, um, but we think it's worth celebrating. Um, but, it, but it's only as good as uh, how we take advantage of it. And that's our message for tonight. Thank you all.